So, um, welcome to our second panel of the day, which is themed on algorithms and uh, financial speculations. Just waiting to see if my slides will appear. And now you can see um, some beautiful trades and maybe currency fluctuation being kind of shown on the screen. And so in this world of um, high frequency trading where uh, a lot of the decisions are automated and uh, happen kind of through machines in real time to kind of Bitcoin, which uh, over the course of last year went from, I think, 1,000 to 20,000 in a year. It's kind of easy to always think about uh, finance algorithms and uh, speculations in, um, in a very contemporary context. But of course, um, I find it interesting to look at uh, some of the history um, of the field and look at uh, how, how things were in the past. So looking at uh, the US housing bubble kind of around uh, 10 years ago when, uh, when a lot of mortgages were giving out to people who couldn't really afford them. And then it's like, it was pretty much like in this graphic. Whoever came up with this graphic is a genius because you had this tiny house that kind of propped up this whole economic system that at one point, of course, collapsed. Then going back further, you had Black Monday in 1987 where I guess a combination of trader behavior and um, computer programs exacerbated the declines in the market. To, of course, the Wall Street crash that um, ended the roaring 20s in much of the Western world. To the South Sea bubble in 1720, when uh, a lot of people invested in the shares of this one uh, South Sea company, which of course collapsed at some point, to the tulip mania here in the Netherlands. So um, yeah, financial crises have always been uh, a part of uh, contemporary and modern history. And uh, yeah, I'm certainly very curious to see how our panelists uh, interpret the, the role of human behavior, algorithms, uh, speculations, and all these kind of regulators, stockbrokers, and all these agents that make part of this um, complex um, financial system that we are all part of today. So, um, to start off with, we will have uh, Inga Lehmanns, who is a professor of cultural history and uh, and her research focuses on early modern cultural history from the 1500s to the 1850 or so, with a special attention for the history of emotions and the body, cultural economy, history of knowledge, and digital humanities. And uh, at this moment, Inge is researching the history of stock trade and the cultural imagination of uh, financial crisis. So, welcome Inge. Thank you so much. And uh, let me get my PowerPoint up as well. Yeah, should be there. Thank you all for coming and thank you uh, uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's really thrilling uh, to see uh, all these uh, artworks about algorithms and about financial uh, speculation and even about historical financial speculations. We'll hear much more about that uh, in the next two uh, uh, talks. Um, uh, artworks, for instance, on tulip mania, uh, perceived as the first uh, speculative bubble in finance. And since I was, as I was walking around and exploring uh, the website here, it really struck me that since uh, 2008, so much more interest has been developing for also these uh, historical um, uh, historical uh, uh, moments of uh, speculation. Uh, and so there's, there's artwork, there are books that are published, there's even a movie that has been made about uh, uh, tulip uh, fever. 
there's actually a quite interesting uh, sort of tension between um, the cultural production, you might say, which is very interested in uh, tulip mania as this moment of madness and exuberance and a very special moment in time, you might say, uh, greed, uh, enthusiasm, uh, over, overly loved uh, uh, for both uh, people and uh, commodities, you might say. And uh, the other one, the economic uh, uh, theory, which sort of tries to rewrite tulip mania as just uh, a normal moment in the history of, uh, of finance, maybe an interesting uh, moment, but not so special. It's just an example of an efficient uh, market, an early market that is just developing, but uh, uh, not something that m uh, should be seen as a, an irrelevant uh episode, uh, uh, for instance. It's just uh, uh, tulips were very special, they were value, valued high, so uh, there is nothing irrational about what was going on in the 1630s. This is an early developing market. And of course here, not so much U Utrecht, but in the Netherlands, we're in the cradle of uh, the stock market. Uh, out here, the 17th century uh, stock trade was invented, uh, you might say, in 1602 when the Dutch East India Company started to issue uh, shares and invited people to buy those shares. Already very early on, a, a very complex market in stock trade was uh, uh, developed and also uh, which is even more amazing, you might say, a uh, market in derivatives, like futures and options and repos, all that complex stuff that we have now. Most of it was already very early on in, uh, in place. And traders were uh, um, negotiating trade, for instance, on the stock exchange in Amsterdam, but also in the streets and in the cafes. Uh, to create uh, liquidity and uh, volatility uh, to the to the market, so fascinating and very uh, strange phenomenon, you might say, that sort of puzzled the minds of the people in the early modern period and has puzzled us, I think, um, since then. Um, so. Um, the, 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 the interest uh, for this, uh, for, this uh, uh, for what is going on in the 17th century, the development of the stock market, uh, tulip mania is only one instance in a series of uh, uh, already uh, uh, first bubbles that were going on before that. So why are we then so much interested in uh, tulip mania? Uh, you might say uh, it's a story that we like to tell uh, ourselves about ourselves, to quote uh, Clifford uh, uh, Geert. It's a story that sort of uh, fits our idea about, okay, we have a uh, fully developed market now, and there were times when things went wrong and people uh, got a bit mad, but now luckily everything is uh, in order. It's a very lively story, of course, it's full of drama. And if you look at it, then you really think, okay, what is going on recently? If we had the 2008 crisis and we look at all the images and the cultural production about that, especially at the moment when it was developing, it is such a, 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 a poor imagery in a, in a way, uh, at least uh, to my eyes. Eh? So, the financial crisis is seen in terms of, uh, of numbers, of graphs. It's seen as a natural phenomenon of something that sort of happens to us, but that we are not uh, a part of. For instance, this artwork depicts the Dow Jones uh, uh, index. You can see there uh, developing as an icy uh, mountain, so very momentous, but not something that is controlled by human beings. And also these images that sort of stuck to your mind, it's a story about numbers, and people are sort of a side show to those numbers, and the only thing they can do is raise their hands in uh, despair, despair uh, with the development of all those numbers. And you can also see that from the graphs uh, that are used to, uh, 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 to sort of think about what a crisis is. So I was really interested, Lua, that you put up this uh, or a similar um, graph for tulip mania, which is also, uh, it features in the film uh, Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps. 
And it's so funny because, of course, in the 17th century, they didn't have graphs. They didn't have data, that for one thing. No one collected data about the prices of tulips as such. Uh, and they didn't think in statistics. The statistics is something that is developed in the 18th and in the 19th uh, century. So the whole idea of how this image has framed our minds so that we even use it uh, as a sort of authentic document for the 17th century uh, uh, crisis, uh, to me, is very funny. Um, and so in, in, the, in the 17th century, no one is drawing graphs, uh, although they are very interested to find out what is that, what is this doctorate that is going on, and how can we understand uh, the dynamics of it? How can we understand uh, financial speculation? And images they come up with is, for instance, this fam uh, famous painting by Jan Bruegel, which depicts uh, the, the, the trade in tulips and in shares and futures uh, on uh, tulips uh, as a scene of a zoo, of a monkey, uh, a monkey scene. And it's at the, often these pictures are analyzed as just a satire um, on stock trade, mim uh, sort of mocking this, the stupid behavior of people who want to uh, become rich very fast. But I think you also need to read the, see them and, and, uh, as a, a way of, um, uh, a mode of analyzing. These are people, painters, who are trying to, under and they use their cultural uh, production to try to understand the patterns of trade. So that is why Bruegel conscious of this zoo, because he's, he's depicting animal behavior to try to understand the human behavior that is behind financial speculation. For instance, uh, the concept that we now call, call herding, people mimicking each other and copying each other's behavior that can lead to overpricing uh, is indeed something that he sees then in the animal uh, world. So my point here is that cultural production, like art, is already in the 17th century used to find, find the patterns behind uh, this very fascinating new phenomenon of uh, uh, stock trading. And that continues. So uh, this is actually the very first uh, stock trade uh, uh, study or investor handbook written by um, uh, a Spanish Jewish merchant uh, uh, in Amsterdam. It's called Confusion de Confusiones. Uh, and it's really sort of a very vivid and detailed description of what is going on on the stock market uh, in Amsterdam. And De La Vega, he uses nearly every kind of science that he has, that he can find, to find patterns in the behavior of the uh, stock market, in the human behavior uh, on the stock market. And again, what he uses is, for instance, all the knowledge that he has in biology and in animal <laughs> zoology. So the about, I just uh, used some digital uh, uh, counting techniques to count all the animals that are mentioned in the text. And it is enormous uh, amount of animals that he uses for examples on, uh, to understand uh, trade behavior. And then he sort of makes different kind of groups. Here are the predators, uh, so a specific kind of merchant is behaving like a predator. Other, others are cunning and resourceful. The other are, others are very uh, sluggish. And even in the end, he comes up with um, a division that we now uh, are calling bulls and bears, but he uses other animals like the giraffe and the uh, uh, raven to think about, okay, some merchants really want to uh, sell and other ones want to buy, some are scared and other ones are really uh, forward. So, and the point here is that they, they are searching for patterns, they find it in the animal uh, uh, world and then they project that onto human behavior. And again, we see this in the uh, 1720s uh, financial crisis, which is often known as the South Sea bubble, but we in the Netherlands called wind trade. And it's very interesting why we use the word wind trade and not uh, bubble, but uh, I don't have the time to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm writing a, an article about that uh, at this moment. Um, 
But here again, you see uh, how cartoons are used, and there was an enormous explosion of cultural uh, production in the 1720s, especially in the Netherlands. Dozens and dozens of cartoons, poems, theater plays were uh, produced. And the merchants would go to the Amsterdam theater to see themselves played on the theater to think about what was going on uh, in, the, in the trade. And the 1720s is interesting because it's, it's a step further than uh, what is happening in tulip mania. Um, it gives also a new kind of uh, um, uh, phenomenon, you might say, the mushroom uh, company. Yeah? So in 1720, they're not only dealing in shares, they're also de uh, there's a, a, a large growth of the amount of companies that are founded. And some of these companies were solid, although they were new. They were companies of, uh, for instance, insurance. And some of them still exist until this very day. For instance, the Rotterdam Insurance Company. Uh, but there are also a lot of companies that were just founded to be able to trade. And there was a company, for instance, that had a great plan to uh, dig uh, a canal from Utrecht to the, South, uh, uh, to the South Sea to open up Utrecht as a harbor city to compete with Amsterdam. Great, great plan, there was but never one spade was put into the ground, although there was a lot of trade uh, uh, going on. Um, so at the 1720s, again, uh, developed uh, a financial bubble. And this is really the first international financial bubble because it connects not only London, uh, Paris, and Amsterdam, but through that, actually, large parts of the world. New Orleans, uh, the Pacific, uh, a global trade is sort of drawn into this moment of... Uh, uh, um, speculative enthusiasm and then the uh, inevitable downfall. And if you look at the cultural production, again, you see how much this, it, the, the, uh, uh, this speculation is seen as a human endeavor and how these cartoons are trying to find out what is going on, what is the dynamics on the trade uh, floor. And they, if you sort of break them open, you can see how all these different merchants are uh, en uh, enacting and uh, engaging in, uh, in trade in a way. You can almost hear the sound of uh, the sounds on the floor. You can almost smell it. Um, and as a researcher, I really would like to be able to construct uh, those scenes, and uh, I'm thinking now about developing sandscapes or soundscapes of the early modern trade floor. Um, but uh, so they're very vivid uh, depictions. Now, why is this so interesting? I think because it shows that uh, trade was seen as a uh, something very human and also driven by emotions and by f bodily engagements of, uh, of traders. And this is something that has been filtered out of economics. There are two movements that happen at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. One of it, one of it is that sort of cultural production is pushed out of this discourse. And the discourse is more and more dominated, of course, by economics, which is developed as uh, an academic discipline. And that academic discipline has no interest whatsoever or even really wants to get rid of the idea of all these emotions being important in, uh, in uh, markets. And so they come up with... Uh, the whole concept of the efficient market, of the homo economicus, this rational trader who all, when he follows his self-interest, uh, uh, try to maximize utilization, and therefore the market is always uh, reliable. And it's a beautiful dream, <laughs> you might say, and it has been uh, very dominant in, uh, in economics for a long time. And only in the last decades, from many, many different sides, uh, scholars uh, are completely re trying to revision this uh, uh, picture. And again, 
think about uh, the market as something that is also driven by human psychology. And this is done by economists, behavioral finance uh, scholars like uh, Robert Schiller, but also by uh, historians and by cultural philosophers uh, like uh, Eva Elus, who says oh, we really need to think about the fact that we have this modern economy which is highly capitalistic, but it's also highly emotional. So there are a lot of ways in which these two are interconnected, and they have been so f since the beginning of uh, capitalism. So we need to go back and rethink how that happened and how that evolved over uh, time. Yeah. Now I come to my last uh, um, my last question. Uh, so. I'm, as a historian, I'm very glad with this uh, development, and I'm also part of it, uh, I hope, uh, to rethink what is going on. Uh, I think it's very important, but then maybe you are thinking, okay, that might be interesting for a stock trade scene or a stock market that is still done by humans. But at this moment, most of stock trade, uh, or at, at least that's what we think, has moved behind screens and is done by algorithms. So what then is the point of even know <laughs> that, uh, looking at uh, uh, the human side uh, uh, of it? Well, there's various answers to that, and I think uh, it might be something that we can talk about during uh, uh, the discussion. One of it might be that uh, only a part of uh, uh, the, the trading scene is um, high-frequency uh, trade. Uh, the other thing is that it's, it's still a human affair. If you go to option trader uh, firms, you see these guys sitting, uh, mostly these guys, I'm sorry, uh, with a lot of screens around them, uh, but there's so much uh, interactivity uh, 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 going on and so much uh, emotion uh, going on. And they're constantly chatting in the mean side that they're constantly reconstructing the algorithms or doing trade. Uh, so an algorithm is not something that you just have and then run it over a system and then leave it be in, uh, in, its, uh, in its long life. No, it's something that needs to be constantly adjusted. So it's still... Uh, triggers a lot of uh, involvement and anxiety. And that anxiety uh, we can research, and that is uh, part of the research uh, that I do. I am sort of try to uh, mine uh, trader chats and see what, uh, when traders are uh, uh, talking about what they are doing, whether you can track the emotions that are uh, going on. And if you do that, then you can really see that it's still a very much uh, an emotional and effective uh, scene. Uh, and I will leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ada. So, next up, we have, whoa, um, Anna Riddler who is an artist and researcher living and working in London. Uh, she has degrees from the Royal College of Art, Oxford University, and uh, University of the Arts London, and she has shown at a variety of institutions, including Ars Electronica, Sheffield Documentary Festival, and uh, Leverhulme Centre for Future Intelligence. She is also currently showing at our Impact exhibition, so if you haven't been there, you should go to Impact Headquarters, where Anna has spent how many days? Three days? Uh, yes, three days. Three days putting up uh, 1,800 um, images that uh, make part of her data set, which she will tell you much more about in this, um, in this current talk. But yeah, definitely go to the exhibition and um, see her data set and the work. And now over to you, Anna. Thank you. I'm going to talk um, about my project Mosaic Virus, which is on show. And one of the things that I'm really interested in um, is how you can work with technology, but also work with technology to kind of talk about, to look at these kind of like moments of history that where things have already occurred. Because I think one of the things that is happening a lot when we're thinking about things like AI or blockchain or Bitcoin or all of these kind of buzzwords that are happening at the moment is 
there are moments in history where some of the same issues have happened and some and you can kind of start to kind of collapse these moments and think through some of these ideas so if you haven't seen it this is just a small clip um, of my piece mosaic virus which i made um and it, using artificial intelligence it's drawing historic parallels from tulip mania um, that uh, swept across the Netherlands in the 1630s to the speculative, the speculation that's currently ongoing around cryptocurrencies. So it's made using a GAN, which um, if people were here this morning was talked about a lot, um, a type of artificial intelligence to, which is creating the image of the tulip, um, updating uh, the kind of like very classic traditional Dutch still life. But the shape and the appearance of the tulip is controlled by the price of Bitcoin. Um, so as it blooms and as it becomes more stripy, that's kind of like reacting to the price of Bitcoin. Mosaic is the name of the virus that causes stripes in a petal, which increase their desirability and helped cause the speculative prices. And so as the stripes go in and go out, that is kind of like showing how the market is fluctuating. And in this piece, I wanted to draw together ideas around capitalism valuable, value and the tangible and intangible nature of speculation and collapse from these two different moments in history that are surprisingly similar. And I'm not the first person to draw comparisons between Bitcoin and tulip mania. In 2013, the former president of the Dutch Central ba Bank described Bitcoin as worse than tulip mania um, because at least with tulip mania, you got a flower at the end of it. <laughs> and there's even a blockchain conference that is called Tulip, um, which at least um, kind of shows some self-awareness. And um, But the moment that I'm particularly interested in um, is the end of last year when Bitcoin was particularly volatile. Um, again, this is another comparison. Uh, in December 2017, Bitcoin reached a high of almost $20,000 before falling below $12,000 within days. And you start getting all of these figures from kind of like um, from the banking community wading into the debate about it, dismissing it as an instrument of speculation and linking it to, you know, as Inga said, this very emotional moment in kind of like cultural consciousness, the 17th century tulip craze. And you know you have the head of J.P. Morgan Chase saying that it is a fraud and only useful for drug dealers, murderers, or inhabitants of North Korea. Um, and but at the same time, what I find interesting is kind of like despite this kind of like pushback from kind of central banks, many banks are both embracing Bitcoin and blockchain technology that underpins it. So you've got this kind of like weird tension that, that's going on there, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and as kind of like was mentioned before, tulip mania was, you know, you saw the tulip prices skyrocket and collapsed. And there is like some question in the academic community whether it was truly a mania, but it's often kind of like held up as this early example of speculative bubble, um, which is why, I, and it's very much kind of like known in cultural consciousness, which is why there are all these recent comparisons to the cryptocurrency boom. And kind of like you can see and there are obviously major differences between because you know these are two we're talking about two complex economic systems but they're kind of being shown in media as being um being quite alike as an unstable frenzy that was doomed from the beginning and i think when you but and which is which is you know arguably true and i think that's that's one way of looking at it but i in my research and when i was making this piece it became apparent that there are links to kind of how Bitcoin works and how tulip mania works that goes beyond how, uh, how the prices of the two just behave on a graph. So one of the things that I found interesting was that you didn't buy tulip bulbs. You bought kind of like slips of paper. You bought promises. So you essentially bought into a futures market during tulip mania. And what would happen is that uh, they would weigh, uh, uh, people would weigh the bulb and this uh, result was recorded in a ledger when it was planted. And then 
as it would grow over the season, it would kind of like then it, the bulb would grow and then it was reweighed when it was lifted out of the ground. But the weights wasn't kind of like it was, they invented a new type of weight for it called azine, which is an extremely small uh, unit of measurement. And from this, it meant that you could start to see how, and it, it was priced by this very small unit of measurement. And this system meant that prices could increase much more rapidly bef than before um, because of the way that tulip bulbs would grow in size when they were in, under, in the ground. So even if the price per weight remained the same, the tulip bulb would grow um, and the value would increase significantly. So for example, one tulip bulb that was planted kind of like... Um, it weighed 81 aces when it was planted, and then it had grown to 416 when it was kind of like lifted out of the ground um, six months later. So this kind of like weighing of it, it, it created a kind of like this future market, futures market, and the, and the words of this poet I really liked where he said that the order of the stock market was introduced to, into the order of nature, and the tulip began to lose the properties and charms of a flower, and became an abstraction, a name, a symbol, interchangeable with a certain amount of money. So the tulip stops becoming a physical thing. And it's this kind of lack of physicality and the way that also the tulip kind of stops becoming a bulb and becomes this, this financial thing that can get cut smaller and smaller and smaller started to remind me of kind of like how Bitcoin exists for us. Because if you Google Bitcoin, at least visually, it's an abstraction. Like, you just get lots and lots of images like this of kind of like black and this electric blue and these kind of like Bitcoin coins, which of course it's not because it's not physical. Um, and it's, it's not a real thing that you can hold. Um, and the other quite nice parallel around kind of like how Bitcoin kind of like works and how it's sold that links quite nicely with the idea of tulips is that Bitcoin is, of course, anonymous, leading it to be called kind of like by some the blood diamonds of the 21st century, which actually does have quite nice with parallels with tulips because tulip bulbs were so valuable and very portable. They became the preferred way for a lot of refu refugee travelers from kind of like Flemish and French refugees for bringing value and bringing their finances into other countries. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, the demand for tulip prices, tulip bulbs, um, was driven partly by um, the desire to kind of like have the most rarest types. Uh, the rare, some of the ra rarest one were the tulips that had these stripes in them, which, as I said, was a result of a virus known as the mosaic virus which gives um, the blooms their distinctive stripes. At the time, there was no understanding about how these stripes occurred. Um, and it turns out that it's actually the result of a disease, of a bug that kind of like um, lays its eggs in the, inside the bulb and that kind of causes the stripe. But at the time, in the 1630s, they had no idea as to why these stripes occurred. And so, you can like because they were and you could have a tulip that would be white one year and then it would be striped the next if the the uh, bug laid its insect uh, its eggs in it. Um, and because its cause wasn't known, it it um, its effects couldn't kind of like be captured. And they did all sorts of crazy things to try and make striped tulips. They would take a like white bulb and a red bulb and cut them in half and glue them together and hope that that would work. They would do things like paint stripes in um, the earth where the tulips were growing and hope that would work. But of course it didn't. Um, which kind of... And this lack of understanding around the thing that's generating wealth kind of like, again, reminded me of the rush towards um, blockchain and kind of like Bitcoin when it started to kind of like really, really, really increase in value. Um, this is an example of the Long Island Ice Tea Corporation changed its name to the Long Blockchain Corporation. And after it did this, shares soared by as much as 500% as soon as the company announced its name change. 
And although kind of like there are Bitcoin related stocks like Nvidia that are capitalizing on the crane on the craze, but also like you get these small little known companies like Riot Blockchain, which was once a struggling biotech company and went through several name changes. But as soon as it kind of like added blockchain to its name um, and started switching its focus to crypto, it, um, it, it starts to kind of like starts to really increase in value. And long blockchain, although it's like an iced tea company and still sell, plans to sell iced tea, it's um, generating kind of like much more much more value um, in the stock market from its name change. And, and there is like one other kind of like really nice link between the mosaic virus and Bitcoin um, for me. Is so the mosaic virus, once the virus kind of like um, the tulip bulb has the virus, uh, it kind of like hurts the flower. It can, it, the flower can no longer produce as many. It becomes finite. And there are only finite, a finite amount of Bitcoins in existence. There are only 21 million, and, which makes Bitcoin more valuable as an asset. But there's this link between kind of like once you have something, it's kind of like it's never going to always be there. It will only ever, it will kind of like bottom out. Um, and just very quickly, uh, tulips at that time kind of like went on to uh, to perform the same function as designer clothes or an expensive car. It was a status symbol. And you can kind of see that happening as well with kind of like items on the blockchain. Um, so this is crypto kitties, which are collectible items that can be like bought, sold and traded with cryptocurrency. And their value depends, like their va value depends on how much pe people are willing to pay for them. And um, it becomes kind of like a digital game um, where players can purchase like certain digital feature, uh, features like eye color, body size, or pedigree, and they can then breed their digital pets. And what I found really interesting is like this does become kind of like a new speculative market. So there were crypto kitties that were that can kind of like command six figures, and there was an auction where there was one that was made by the art director of crypto kitties that was originally its price was um, 10k and it was and then sold at auction for 140k and it was bought by a hedge fund manager so you're starting to see again the speculative bubble happening with even within speculative bubbles and what i think is another thing that is both similar to all these kind of like bubbles that have been mentioned and that have been talked about is that the first winners become the cheerleaders for it. So you're now kind of starting to see, just like you would see in kind of like tulip mania, where you would see the kind of like paintings of tulips occur, you're now starting to see more and more emphasis on um, how you can make money and how the people should kind of like start engaging and interacting with Bitcoin. And so I, really wanted just to draw together these two moments and start to explore it, not just at a superficial level, but really start to kind of like unpick and find these connections and draw them together. Thank you so much, Anna. And so now we have uh, Oliver Smith from the Demystification Committee. Uh, which studies the intensities of uh, late capitalism with an ongoing focus on the relationship between sovereignty and capital and on the friction between networks and power structures. It was established in 2016 and is chaired from London and Berlin. And so welcome, Oliver. Hello. I'm going to start with some sound. We are close to a thousand point decline. Guys, 
once again, 75 even off. We are now, guys, 70 even off of 69 tree. I don't mean to sound like a broken record here, but this thing just continues to break records. Okay, so thank you, Luba, uh, and thank you for your presentations as well. Um, uh, what I'm going to just explain is what you heard. Um, that was an excerpt from uh, a performance, a recording of a performance we did uh, earlier this year in London, um, entitled Network Study 14, Flash. Uh, it was carried out between 2.32 and 2.57 p.m. Uh, on May the 6th. It's an attempt at sonifying market information from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, exactly eight years previously on that day. So on that day in 2010, between 2.32 and 2.57, a flash crash wiped a trillion dollars from the U.S. stock markets. No satisfying explanation was given for this until around five years later, when a market trader was arrested in Hounslow, West London, and extradited to be prosecuted in the US. And even this isn't necessarily a particularly satisfying explanation. This is a critical accident of financial markets and a moment of rupture in a really politically intense time for Europe, although it's interesting that it manifests in the US. And that kind of connection is something that we'll discuss in a bit. Paul Virilio noted that if time is money, then speed is power. Stock market trading was once a person-to-person -person activity, then person-to-phone, and then terminal-to-terminal, -terminal. although, as Inga noted, there's still people involved in that process. Software speaks to software in this, and we kind of abandon our ideas of the living in favor of this sort of void of rapidity that crops up. Within this come accidents, or in Virilio's terms, ruptures, um, and the past decades have seen a number of these, uh, and the scale and the scope and the speed of the market increases. Uh, and, and this is kind of coupled with a shifting of sovereignty out of states and into markets as a, as a super, uh, super state actor. Uh, another thing that's been mentioned earlier, but we've, we've kind of looked at before as well, and I'll try and draw some links to it in this presentation, is um, Black Monday 1987, uh, which was an important accident of early computerized trading. Um, in the words of our friends in the Italian collective Obsolete Capitalism, the higher the imminence of the market, the greater the likelihood that interruptions, leaks, crashes, viruses, and bifurcations create conflict, or replace conflict, rather. So, on May the 6th, 2010, an interesting set of seemingly unconnected events take place, and this is where we trace our um, sound from, it's in the day from. So on that day, there's a set of street protests and clashes in Athens as a result of the approval of austerity measures uh, aimed at preventing the country's default on loan payments. And it's kind of interesting in this idea of uh, super state actors that this is imposed by the Troika, a trio of non-state entities. Equally, um, it's the day of uh, a general election in the United Kingdom um, in which the country sees a hung parliament, which is a rare event in the UK. Um, and it, it suggests a, a massive lack of confidence in, in the structures of power in that country, which, you know, is ongoing. Um, throughout that day, a London trader rides this uncertainty to his financial benefit. He uses a piece of trading software that he's had modified and which he refers to as the matrix, so cool, uh, to layer different orders on the market. With an ear out for the news, and as the uncertainty of the day's events increases, he places buy and sell orders at increasing pace and with mechanistic speed, kind of amplifying his actions through this piece of software. He's fast, of course, but his automation is even faster. He's choreographing this kind of cascade of trades, and the way he discusses it um, 
is kind of amazing. You see here, he says, if he trades well on a volatile day, he could make around $133,000. So he's very aware of the fact that he's operating within a state of uncertainty, and he picks his moments very ca carefully. Um, so he's trading as he's done many, many, many times before, but something's wrong. Something's happening as a result of this, perhaps as a result of this, perhaps as a result of kind of Athens, of the UK, and various other things. His networked financial activity misleads other market players. So larger entities start to react to his actions, um, and in the context of this volatility, uh, his interference is perhaps a kind of amount of noise that pushes a new signal into the market. Um, all these different actors feed on each other's mistakes. There's a feedback loop that overloads the financial networks um, with orders and takes it in a downward spiral. So the narration we hear at the start comes from um, US TV market commentators. They're sat in a, in a TV studio discussing uh, what's happening, what they're seeing on the market. It's a moment where, remember, no one knows why this is happening. This is not something that is ordinary. This is not a regular event. Um, of course, markets crash. That's what happens. But the speed at which this is happening and, and the reasons for it are really unclear. So their voices crack as they attempt to keep up with the pace of decline that they're seeing. The interesting thing in this moment, though, is that they're already too late. Network latency has been introduced, which means that they're 30 to 60 seconds behind what's actually going on. So those people narrating, kind of screaming, desperately trying to keep up in, in their voice with what's going on, they don't know what's going on because they're an age late in technical trading terms, right? There's so much delay. And then what kicks in is the beep you heard earlier. Uh, this is the automated circuit breaker, and this halts trading for a few seconds. This is put in place through regulation um, to offer a respite for the market. Uh, it's intended to allow things to reset, reconfigure, everyone to stop basically having mania, um, uh, and the machines also to stop their mania um, and allow the market to rebound. And it does, actually. It rebounds to fairly close to its previous level. So in terms of the market, as, a, as an entity, as a, as a thing, it survives relatively unscathed. Um, but its participants aren't necessarily so lucky. So within this market scape, we have big players, we have small players, um, but we're not necessarily that the effects of this crash are not the same for all of them. But at this point as well, the Hounslow trader has called it a day. He, he left well before the decline kicked in. So he's, he's taken his money and he's gone. He made about a million dollars. He was using a technique called spoofing. So placing very quickly and modifying very quickly and cancelling very quickly sell and buy orders uh, without executing them. So he alters the perceived supply and demand of different commodities on the market um, and inflates through that or deflates the market. He has a piece of modified software, as I mentioned earlier, um, which alters this, these, these prices on its own um, uh, and keeps them just, so if he's offering to sell, he keeps them at just a slightly worse price than the best one on the market. And if he's offering to buy, he offers slightly less than the top. So this, this piece of software keeps things in that. Um, and he's all, through all this, he's actually looking to make the money on a different commodity, which the program then automatically purchases or sells, depending on his aims. So during the performance, we use uh, real-time trading data from the markets, the historical moment um, that we extract from the, the graph you saw earlier uh, and a few other sources that offer it. It's quite a, a, a useful source of, of learning for traders. Um, and we mix it with wireless network data from the location at which uh, the trader uh, was trading. And through it, we, we aim to open up ideas of the uh, political economy of speed and some of the implications of this. So um, we then have a number of questions that we can kind of ask about this. Um, we sort of we see Sorrell's tactic of spoofing as well. It, it capitalizes on confirmation bias within the markets, and it's in some ways a little like fake news for algorithms. Um, 
but the feedback loops and the systems within markets, the way they're connected, mean that small actions, if they're problematically timed, and there's really no way of knowing what that problematic time is because of the interconnection of a variety of things, can have spiraling effects. And these can be widely problematic in a larger scale, but also incredibly financially beneficial to some actors. So people, it's possible to make money on the rise and the fall of the market, right? So in this way, we can say that through this chaos, this kind of interconnection, this change, um, possibly each accident spawns its own innovation. Um, following the 1987 crash, the US in, uh, investigation into it suggested that the separate marketplaces around the world were in fact operating as one market. And we heard a little bit about that earlier as well in the way that, you know, that's not new to the 80s necessarily, um, but it might be exacerbated by technology and by the transmission of news media. Um, and that was what the circuit breaker that we hear was um, put in in response to. So it's an attempt to solve or help that problem. But it's also uh, a kind of intervention in something that's supposed to be natural, that's supposed to be um, able to regulate itself. And for whose benefit does this intervention happen and who, who, who suffers from this addition of regulation perhaps and who gains? Um, it potentially helps the larger players who can wait out a 25 minute crash, right? If you've got the money, you can go, okay, this is going down, but I'll see where it goes. It might come back, wait for the halt and, and you know, on the rebound, you, you reclaim some of it. But if that's where all your money is, if it's got a direct connection to something like your pension fund, you know, you don't want to wait and see, you want to know. So there's an imbalance of power in that. Um, and the speed at which things happen kind of further exacerbate that. So I'm actually a little ahead of time, which is a miracle. I'm going to con conclude here by, say, by co quoting Deleuze and saying that there is no fear, need to fear or hope, but only listen for new weapons. Thanks. So thank you so much, Oliver. And yeah, Inga, Anna, please do, do join me on stage. And now we have some time for discussion. So yeah, I will ask the panelists a few questions and then uh, yeah, we'll, we'll open it up to the audience. So uh, Anna, Oliver and Inga, thank you so much for kind of giving an overview of uh, some of the kind of ideas and behavioral patterns um, during all these past crises, and of course with the focus on tulip mania, Bitcoin, and uh, the flash crash. And um, yeah, I think we've kind of observed all these instances, and uh, it seems like there are kind of various components that play a role in, uh, in these crises. And um, yeah, I'd like to hear from you all as to what you think are kind of the main actors in, uh, in these crises. So who is normally to blame for, for the fallout that happens? Is it kind of, is it the system? Is it, um, I, I, I don't know, the behavior of, of the people or is it the regulators? What is kind of your take on that? So I can talk from the perspective of the flash crash and Sorrell, perhaps, um, in which he is very strongly blamed for the events, but I would consider that an unfair judgment. He's currently, um, and I can't remember the exact uh, state of, of his prosecution. I believe he is taking some kind of um, uh, bargain whereby he's helping the US government track down people doing similar things. And, and he's blamed as, and, and yes, there is a moment at which his actions might trigger things, but actually the interconnection of things is such that, you know, he can't truly be held responsible, I think. But I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be his lawyer right now. But it's interesting that before he was kind of pointed out, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, thought that it was a single large algorithmic trader based somewhere in the US that was the cause, right? So they looked at a particular speed of data. They could access maybe data from every minute, I think, or every few seconds. Um, and from that analysis, it was like 
the culprit is this trader based in the US. A small company whose graph we showed called Nanex had access to tick level data and had done their own analysis. And through that, they identified that it came from another source. So I think there's this interesting thing in, in looking at different speeds. So at different speeds of action, we see different culprits. And so I think there's really there's an interesting tie between speed and these kind of uh, events. Yeah. And I would add, uh, yeah, that, that's something that you brought up. It's not only who is to blame, but also who profits and who uh, uh, is the one who uh, leaves with the, the largest uh, debts. And that is often people who come latest to the markets and are not the most professional and don't have the sort of amount of uh, strength uh, financially to uh, to stick to the to the game. And that happens at the beginning of the 17th century, and it's still the case. Uh, uh, now. Yeah, I would agree. It's the I think it's the lack of understanding that I think is problematic in in how these bubbles occur around the people who are kind of like coming in late in the game, who are listening to kind of like as I mentioned the cheerleaders who kind of really kind of like sell the the thing, whether it be housing or tulips or Bitcoin. Um, that encourages this kind of like um, this big uptick at the end of it. Yeah, and um, I remember what I always found very interesting about the the recent financial crisis of uh, 2008 and 2011 that kind of started with the U.S. bubble and then kind of moved over to the eurozone uh, was. Um, kind of the, the close relationship between the banking sector and uh, the regulators. So I think in the US, it's always kind of common that, I think it was Henry Paulson or whoever was kind of the chairman of the Federal Reserve and was kind of, had the power to kind of um, allocate the, the money and save the economy. He was somebody who had previously worked at Goldman Sachs which is one of the most important investment banks. And of course, he still had all his uh, friends there who he wanted to um, kind of to bail out and uh, to save their career and reputation. And whereas it seemed to me that it was kind of the, the ordinary man on the street that had to suffer because his house got uh, repossessed. But the, the Goldman Sachs boys, they could still continue their at playing kind of their trades. So yeah, I wanted to um, yeah, to see what, what you all think about um, yeah, the role kind of uh, human behavior has uh, in, this, in this field and uh, also kind of the way, well certainly in that case, it seemed that the people who caused the crisis, they were all saved, but it was the ordinary kind of people uh, who became the victims and if, if that is something that um, you think is particular to that crisis or uh, happens a lot, and um, yeah, if there's something we can do to prevent that. Uh, it happens a lot, but it's uh, really a different uh, story, I think. from If you look at the 1720s, uh, for instance, <clears throat> and you look to uh, London and to Paris, then you see, see the same pattern. There was not a lot of regulation uh, going on. Uh, so the market was sort of opened up for people who had no grasp of what uh, the boundaries for trade uh, were. So when things turned out bad in the end, then uh, the, the poorest in a way, or the, uh, the, uh, the lower classes who came in later, uh, had had the, the hardest um, uh, effects. Whereas if you l look at uh, the situation in the Netherlands where there was a lot of regulation going on and there was a safety net for the uh, stock market, um, actually the whole financial crisis of the 1720s was not that severe uh, because it sort of didn't bounce back into a society. The traders kept it among themselves and they sort of took their losses uh, uh, where, they, uh, where they could. They didn't go into uh, 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 lawsuits. There was a lot of uh, uh, peer pressure, you might, uh, might say. Most of them would consider 
going into lawsuits and trying to find the money back as something that would be detriment to their um, uh, to their uh, uh, status. So a lot of the the um, regulation was done by uh, honor, by face to face uh, 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 trade, uh, and that is, that is something I think that. Uh, moves away if uh, you have a, a, a screen trade, where then is sort of the uh, look each other in the eye and decide what is what is good in a, in, in a market. Uh, uh. And so the, it, it, my point would be there are state regulation, which is very, very important to set uh, boundaries and securities, but there's also something like interhuman uh, behavior uh, that creates different kinds of uh, moral uh, uh, structure for the for the market, and it's very much a question how that operates in an algorithm kind of world. Sorry, that might be. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think I think that the the re the reduction of um, human to human contact uh, can can cause this kind of increased belief in uh, homo economicus as the actual state of being, right? This idea that we are somehow ultimately rational is very easy to believe if you're sat in front of a screen of seemingly rational numbers on your own or, or in a room of other people kind of not paying a huge amount of attention to you and really paying attention to these numbers. And if you see things charted, I think what the, the visual representation of the market activity or the the sonic representation, of course, and, and other representations are really crucial to kind of trying to, to work around that belief in ultimate rationalism, perhaps. And that's also why I think it's so important eh, to create these, uh, these artworks around it, because I've been talking a lot with people in finance, and they really see themselves as sort of separate from society, and also separate from history. We're here, we're just doing the calculations, we're making the numbers, uh, we have nothing to do with financial crisis, it's just uh, disconnected from society in a way. And if we, if we don't create narratives that engage them within uh, the context of society, then you just leave that uh, leave that be. Yeah? So it's it, it's it's really a question of saying, okay, it's just me and my screen. I'm making a bit of money. Sometimes I lose a few. If it's not me, then it's another guy. Uh, who cares? The, 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 there is no there is no impact on my uh, on my behavior. So uh, I think showing that this is actually a community with a high impact on society is something we need to keep on doing because there's a really strong tendency for finance to move out of the realm of uh, uh, yeah, social uh, viewing or, or uh, cultural thinking, I think. Um. Yes, so, yeah, some good points. And um, now I would like to uh, bring AI into the discussion because I know that was you know, very much um, also key to um, Anna's work and her interest in the field. And um, there are a couple of things that I find interesting when uh, kind of rela relating AI and uh, finance. One is, of course, the way some of these machine learning techniques are now used to power a lot of these um, trades. And uh, the other is also kind of looking at the world of AI itself. And sometimes I wonder, like other people in the industry, if it is all becoming a bubble. So if you're a um, PhD student who has, who has um, um, yeah, studied machine learning, sometimes you can end up with a salary of half a million. And uh, previously, if you were, if you wanted to make your money, you would kind of go into finance. But now you could knock on Google's or Facebook's door and they would kind of uh, offer you uh, a, a better deal perhaps than uh, uh, what was kind of previously um, found in, in, the, in, in the finance sector. So um, yeah, I'd like to hear kind of from uh, Anna in, in particular yeah. as to, I guess, how you see this AI world and how it relates yeah. to kind of the crisis. It's Definitely, like you were saying, that now if you if you study machine learning, you can basically name your own salary. Whereas 20 years ago, if you studied artificial if 
you studied artificial intelligence, you didn't tell people that you studied artificial intelligence because that's what like all the crazy kind of like just outside of science people did. And now that you just see this huge boom in it as an industry. And that was also one of the reasons why I chose to make the piece with um, using machine learning because I'm really interested in how you can use machine learning and AI as kind of like as a way of referencing kind of like the, the subject matter. So I didn't want to just use it because it, it was there, but I really wanted to kind of like link again, as Luba mentioned, to kind of like these different bubbles, the tulip mania, Bitcoin, and then this bubble that is happening that you can see happening around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Because when you, you look in the papers and it's just kind of like, you see it, you know, like you see the kind of like all of these headlines around Google creating new languages because like it's, it's chatbots um, have started talking to each other and things like that. Um, which when you actually kind of like go down and read the detail, it's just not there and it's all very sensationalist. Um, and then the other kind of like nice thing as well, I think about using machine learning for this project uh, is that when you train a model, um, it kind of like its learning rate kind of like gets better and better and better and then will suddenly just crash. So kind of like the way that the type of machine learning that I use works, the kind of like way that it learns echoes the way that the stock market works, like things get better and better and then we'll just randomly crash. And so those kind of connections I think are quite nice to, to kind of like reflect the subject matter. So those are kind of like two points of why I chose to use this rather than doing it. You know, I could have like animated, use it or done kind of like a time lapse with those photographs. But I think by using artificial intelligence, you can start to again, kind of like make these connections into these like different moments and these different stories and bring them all together. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm really interested <laughs> in that idea of, of growing and growing and then crashing. Are there techniques and methodologies for understanding why that happens? Or is it, I don't know a lot about machine learning, but is it something that just happens? Or is there like, you can gradually pick it apart? So I mean, it, it will just like randomly happen. Yeah. So like you can, there are some, you can kind of like tell it's gonna happen sometimes because like of the training data that you've got or kind of like the different weights that you're using. But normally it, you think it's not gonna happen and it does. It's called mode collapse that um, it's, yeah, it's, but yeah. I'm just, I'm just think, thinking out, out loud here, but if, if a field has a technique that has that process built into it and can develop techniques for kind of understanding that, can we apply them to other things? Is it the same? Is it, yeah, I, it's an interesting link between things that boom and crash and taking those techniques across different domains is, is sometimes quite an interesting process yeah. and, and you've totally yeah done it and I, I just wondered if there's like yeah anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah and I think that was uh, yeah kind of very interesting addition into looking what we can um, kind of learn from uh, one field and uh, apply to another and uh, yes yeah, so we have uh, two artists here and um, yeah, I was uh, I was wondering how you saw um, your role in um, kind of uh, communicating or kind of encouraging discourse around uh, some of these um, kind of issues of uh, finance and kind of power dynamics and and governance that um, that are key to today's systems. Like, yeah, how important is the role of the artists here? So. I think it's very important, but I think one of the one of the uh, one of the reasons why I kind of like made the piece was to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier around how you kind of like see this kind of, how we normally kind of like experience these markets as very kind of like graphs and charts and numbers and data. And as someone said, after I like made my piece, I've basically just made a really fancy poetic Bloomberg terminal, and. <laughs> It's just like, it's a way of kind of like experiencing this stuff, but in a, in a very, very different way. So I'm really interested in how you can take, take these things and kind of like transform it, whereas, and still kind of like retain a critical eye and use it as a way of exploring different, these different moments in history to open up our understanding of what is actually going on now. I, I would agree with that. <laughs> um, I, I think it's that 
and and we were talking a little bit earlier as well about this this idea of the the uh, affect of trading that's lost as we kind of go into this technical realm. Um, but the technical realm is not only in in stock markets and things. It, it pervades all aspects of contemporary society. It's kind of within states, outside of states, um, and it operates at a speed beyond that which we can kind of perceive in real time. So it's important that we, uh, you, I think one of the purposes of art is and, and design is to go back in that timeline, not necessarily a long way, sometimes a long way, sometimes a little way, but but pull things out that seemed important and, and, and really stretch them and look in the, the cracks and the ruptures within the cracks and the ruptures. And I think as a, as a, as a tool to, to, to expand upon or, or look back upon things, um, it can be an incredibly useful one. Um, and that, that idea of visualizing and stretching things, I think, is a, is a key part. Yeah, and it's also kind of like halfway between kind of like journalism and kind of like, and also not. And I think there's something there when you're using, you're using reality and you're using true kind of like facts to then create a different type of discussion. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it, uh, finance sort of moves behind large uh, uh, skyscrapers with uh, mirrored walls and you can't see inside and it's all getting very complex with a lot of uh, algorithms that you can't understand. So this is a way of developing different narratives and de developing different ways, I think, of understanding uh, what is going on. In the 17th century, the stock exchange was the, the most popular building in Amsterdam. People would go there, they would climb to the first floor and then look down on the uh, trade floor to see what was going on. And they could see in the dynamics of the trade whether there was speculation going on in terms of timing, bumping into each other, a lot of conflict going on. So the, the, uh, of course, the assignment is different uh, uh, now, but it's still very urgent, I think, that we create these, uh, uh, all these various narratives to, to be able to understand. Only maybe a question then is, uh, so speculation has turned into a term of uh, uh, calculating. Yeah? The speculating is, uh, but in the 17th century, speculation would be uh, more imaginative uh, speculation, eh? so the, 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 the possibility of thinking of n new worlds, like with Bitcoin, that is something that wasn't there and it is speculated. Someone had an idea that is imaginative and that is also some making something new. Your artwork can also function like that, be part of that market because you're sort of helping create these new speculative uh, Worlds, and so th that, that's, this is just to be annoying. But yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it can. It, so uh, at one point you, you're creating narratives. You might be critical, but you can also be part of creating the value and helping uh, to to add to the value of uh, the world of bitcoins or uh, uh, trade in a way, which doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be a, 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 a horrible point indeed, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's that the interesting thing where things run on the the kind of mythology of things. I think there's a there's a danger of I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a danger of doing that because that's kind of the perspective we work from is that these things are problematic. Um, but I think it's still important to do them because without operating in those worlds, those worlds become, like you say, closed off behind doors and, and spaces for other things. I, in other works we've done, we've operated with other kind of problematic systems and, and problematic structures in a way that slightly implicates us, not in a massive way, but in, in their use. However, I think if you don't try, you kind of, you operate from a world of less understanding and less experience than those that you perhaps put yourself in opposition to. Okay, now I'd like to see if we have any questions from the audience. I have these lights blinding me, um, but um, if, you do raise a, if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll see if we can get uh, one of our panelists to answer it. Oh, I see somebody. Sorry, it's just going back to, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, wait for the mic uh, so we can record it for uh, the live stream. 
Uh, it's just going back to a point that was raised earlier, which was about the mode crash, as you uh, were mentioning it there. Do you, uh, do you know why it's happening? Have you any idea why it does? And is there any, can you envisage a solution to that happening? Or is it just, as you say, it just happens, it's random? I, are you talking about like how it works when I'm training yes. my algorithm? Yes. So it's, it's kind of like, you, you get it and then you can kind of like, you can go and you go back into the code and you try and tweak things and you try and change it. And you sometimes, when you do it a lot, you get a sense of kind of like why it might be happening. But because I'm not a computer scientist, uh, like my, the way that I kind of like work with this stuff is quite intuitive. So it's kind of, it's not, I'm sure if I was very, very technical, I would have a better idea and a better understanding of why it's happening. But it is just something that happens, like when you're running this code, like, and if you're trying to do something that maybe is new or unusual, you're trying to upscale or you're trying to do something different to what the code was originally written for. Like you will get these things where, you know, and I had a little video, but I ran out of time where you kind of like, it starts to work. So, you know, you start to get something that looks like a tulip and it starts to look like a better tulip and then it will just collapse and it will just turn into nonsense noise. And you, so it's like very much this process of trial and error when you start to kind of like what, look at like why it's, why it's done this. Thank you. I might as well just ask one too. Um, I find it really interesting the conversations uh, that, that, that are being had around the idea of, of, of data um, and the perception of truth. And I, I think from what I'm kind of gathering, it seems that, that Oliver, your practice is, is analyzing um, historical data and Anna, you're actually creating your own data. Um, and I was wondering maybe the three of you, um, including Inger, could, could speak about the role of, of data, um, yeah, or the manipulation or the construction of data in the understanding um, of a perceived truth. I, I, to, to talk specifically about that project again, the thing that we found really interesting about the data and that it's not only generated from data, some of it's, there's lots of kind of interpretation going on and we obviously have the samples um, of, of news, but the, the fact that there were two massively distinct conclusions drawn by looking at very quick data and slower data, I think is really super important for understanding that for having an understanding of the way data might be interpreted or might work or might influence um, society in that your choice of the way you analyze or interpret it is as important or perhaps even more important than the data itself. Um, the processes through which you, you throw it, I think, uh, have, the, have the power in it, perhaps. Yeah, I'm trying to create uh, data for my uh, my research, which is, uh, which is which is quite hard because, of course, I, you work with so many different kind of uh, source materials, but it's really necessary, I think, because if I want to communicate with people from other disciplines, like in, uh, economists, they don't see the argument in what I'm doing. Uh, unless there is like data they can get <laughs> that is calculative, um, but of course uh, the data that I make are sort of um, yeah extracted from very complex uh, historical uh, uh, reality. So I'm always sort of uh, balancing between the usefulness of doing uh, data research uh, and um, uh, the, yeah critical questions about what I'm doing if I capture uh, pieces of historical information and turn, turning them into seemingly um, uh, comparable uh, uh, data. But I, and what I really like is these new kinds of uh, representing uh, 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 the data. My students often just use a data set and then throw it into some kind of off-the-shelf visualization uh, uh, tool and then don't think about what happens if you uh, represent it in that uh, way. So. No, so I did make a large part of, well, I made my data set to train the um, algorithm that I ran, uh, the model that I made for the piece. 
And there were, to your point, like, I think it was very important for me to do that because there was no off-the-shelf data, uh, Tulip data set. Um, and there are these kind of, like, these issues that you have when you're trying to label something, when you're trying to name it around, you know, so you have a Tulip, and is, is it white or is it pale pink? And when, as soon as you're having to decide to put it in a bucket, then it becomes, you know, it becomes that thing. And when you're trying to do, and that when you do it 10,000 times is A, very time consuming. And B, it makes you realize that when, you know, these, these algorithms that run off these data sets, someone has always made a decision about this is X and not Y, or this is Y and not Z. And how easy it is, A, how easy it is to make mistakes, and B, how subjective it is. Because I might think it is pale pink and not white, but someone else might think it's white. And so there are all these kind of like issues, I think, around creating data sets and working with them that I think are, are really important to consider. But also the nice thing that you do is, that if you think about a bubble and these visualizations of a, of a graph, they always have the same story, and the story ends in the same way, with, whereas your visualization really shows at, uh, the constant process of, of change uh, and uh, that the tulip can go any, any direction. So it's all about where you are in what moment of time where it can go. Whereas if you see that graph, there is... It, it seems like one-way street, a, a story that will always develop in the same uh, same side. But on your visualization, it's quite quite different. Yeah. So I think at this point we have to wrap up. <coughs> and um, yeah. So now is the time where you can go and grab some food, and uh, you should come back here to this hall for um, the next thing in our program, which is a keynote by Julia Kloiber. And yeah, I believe she will tell us uh, some interesting things about uh, science fiction and uh, some kind of positive applications of this technology and how you can use it for good. So be back here at 8 p.m. <laughs>